Hi, I'm Guy Lawrence and you are listening to the Guy Lawrence podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to find out more and join me and come further down the rabbit hole, make sure you head back to guylawrence.com.au. Awesome guys, enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, mate. How are you? I'm very well. I really appreciate you coming on, buddy. My pleasure. Now... If you sat on an airplane next to a complete stranger and they asked you what you did for a living, what would you say <laughs> you did? I breathe. <laughs> I breathe for a living, pretty much. And uh, I try to smile for a living. And uh, I just be, I, I guess that's, uh, for me, that's, that's one of the things that uh, uh, I've come to realize is that um, the, the, the only thing we need to do is to be and whatever that it means for you is, is perfect for you. And whatever that means for me is, is perfect for me. Yeah. Well, I can tell you what it means for me now. And the one thing I've really, and it took a lot of courage, Pete, but it's almost really find my, my truth, yep. my authentic self mm-hmm. and, and not waver for anyone or anything or anyone else in that self well it's your identity and identity is is a very interesting topic to delve into about uh who are you and what what is your authentic self and going back to your first first question is the only purpose i see that we have is to be our authentic selves is to express our authentic nature whatever whatever way that is and for you, it will be completely different than me. And, and who knows how different it is. It might be a small bit. It could be extremely large. It could be the complete opposite. And, and, it, and that is perfect because each and every single one of us on this planet, everything has their own authentic self. And what, what are you going to do with that? What do you want to share? Who do you want to express? How do you want to express yourself? Is I mean, obviously, it's multifaceted. It's not just I am a chef, for instance. That's what people think of me, or a judge on a TV show, or a father, or a husband, or a lover, or a son, or a brother, or a um, uncle, or a entrepreneur, or a student, or a teacher, or a a uh, searcher or a, I don't fucking know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, what is that identity? What is that for you is uh, because we can play as many characters as we choose to. We can put on a mask for every different situation. You know, my podcast mask now is going to be very different than the podcasts that I just did for the last hour because it's in relation to the like for instance you guy uh, have already started this podcast in a very different way than the last podcast yeah and uh, i adapted myself my my identity still pete evans presenting and i i encapsulate the pete evans I, that's that's the name that I've been given of the family that I've been born into. Peter was the name given to me. Evans is the family name. I still presented my identity in that last podcast, but I already feel that this one's going to go a lot deeper. So <laughs> I, 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 I'm already removing that mask that I used in the last podcast and, and presenting a different or not a different version another expanded or or version to my character or my authentic self, but it is still purely Pete Evans here, but it's, uh, it's how deep are we going to go onto this podcast? And Uh, I'm excited about this one. (laughs) But there's, there's almost the word that comes to mind that I've had to come, especially coming from Wales, ex, you know, I played a lot of rugby, Pete, like it was all about beer, drinking, proving my manly worth through all these things. And, and it still seems to be that for a lot of people too, that are in that, that 
that uh, profession. Or yeah, for that, sure. That, that culture is probably the better word. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And and I'm and I'm still a proud Welshman, and I loved every lesson that it taught me along the way. But then there's this this kind of moment of almost uh, I don't know. There's like a a bigger itch to scratch inside. That then you start asking the questions. And the word that sort of comes to mind now, and dare I say it, is almost vulnerability in, mm -hmm. in the moments of the conversations. And that's the word that just jumped out at me then. Like when you say you were in the last podcast, be it portraying this person, and but not even portraying it, allowing that authentic self to come out for the to meet the conversation at hand. To this, why do you think we struggle with vulnerability? <laughs> vulnerability. <laughs> uh it's a it's it's a really good question so vulnerability for me would be exposing your authentic self with and 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 obviously when you expose your true nature your true self which you, all of us our our true self is one of unconditional love trust and acceptance but we are brought up in a society that doesn't celebrate that you know, especially in the Australian culture. And I'm using the word culture again because it is a culture. <laughs> Excuse me. I've, uh, I've had a busy, busy couple of weeks and I'm eating some food that I'm not used to. So um, I'm doing oh, some right. filming. And to, so my, my, um, my immune system is a little bit compromised at the moment. But um, the vulnerability that we have is shaped, I, I believe, through our upbringing. And I mean, if you think about, and I'm not an expert in this, it's, these are just observations. And I've spoken with people that I, that I respect that uh, are, are much more eloquent and have, have studied this and it's their career to analyze this and present it in a way that makes a lot more sense. But I will do my little best here to, to put it into some simple context. But so if we have the understanding or if we accept the belief that we are all born into this world as pure beings of unconditional love, that's, that's our default. That's that if you look at a baby, it's just, they're just pure love. Their identity still is not formed at that point of, uh, of, of birth. Surely they've taken on some, from my understanding and, and the, 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 realizations and the truth is that babies through their um uh, through the period of conception to birth they will still take on certain aspects or belief systems from their parents uh by default basically through um what they've witnessed and the emo the emotional well-being especially of their mother while they're in the womb um but generally as they as as they're born they are just pure beings of, of love and we all are we all start that way <laughs> we, but but we quickly learn that um, there are rules in place for us to behave in a certain way to receive unconditional love or to receive conditional love from either our parents or our culture or society or our friends and family members, you know, and, and I'll just throw a, a simple one out there. The baby crying, for instance, you know, how many parents would think that, that they would project something onto that child that how come my, my child is crying now when so on or somebody else's child is sleeping through the night? How come, their baby is sleeping 12 hours a night, except I have to get up five or six times during the night because my baby isn't this, you know? So all of a sudden you could imagine that the, the, the change of identity or understanding or love that that baby would feel from their parents. They would feel that there's something energetically not right with them. And that just then starts to form layers of their identity. Totally. And then as we progress through the years, we are basically putting on layer after layer after layer after layer after layer after layer through incidents after incidents after moments in our life that are forming these belief patterns or belief systems, which you could say 
are forming our, our identity in how we view ourselves and as a protective mechanism for ourself as to how we are going to function in this world. So we can please others and oftentimes we will, we will not present our authentic self in a way that feels honest and open to us and, and show our vulnerability because we do not want to upset somebody else or we've learnt through our experiences of life that if we do show that, then um, the consequences can be hurtful for either ourselves or for others. So we end up uh, padding ourselves with these identi this identity that just is layer after layer after layer, which protects ourselves. And if unresolved, any of these issues, they can lead into the choices that we make around food, the choices we make, especially around relationships that we choose to enter into, the types of people that we hang out with, whether it be our friends, the jobs that we seek and feel comfortable in to express ourselves, mm -hmm. the, uh, the pets that we have, the types of sports that we play, the culture, that the, the, the city that we live in the environment or the culture or the country that we choose to live, the books that we choose to read, the TV shows that we tend to gravitate towards or the podcasts that we listen to or the people that inspire us or the people that we hate or dislike, all of this feeds our sense of self, which is a very common misconception because our sense of self, if we look at ourselves as other people see us as this identity of, of Guy or Pete Evans, people would make up their judgments about us very quickly. And, and it could be, for instance, in my, my position, I'm a judge on a TV show. So we have close to a million to 2 million people watching that mm. of a night time. And what do they get to see? They get to see Pete Evans in a suit, judging food on a reality-based TV show that is created to, for entertainment, for a marketplace of people that have an identity that like to watch this type of show, right? So they get to see or they get to project their own... Uh, it's all... I, uh, definition of who I am on that snapshot of a role that I'm playing in a certain program. And it's funny because you meet people in the street or somewhere they go, Oh, you're very different from that, that from what we see on television. I'm like, really? No fucking way. <laughs> like, did you actually just say that? Because that is, one of my identities that I'm playing in that position, you know, do I go around my day-to-day -day life judging, judging people and judging their food? No, I, I, not on purpose. I don't, but in that role that I've chosen to do, I do. That's, yeah. that's my job, so to speak in, in that part, but I have many different jobs and identities that, 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 uh, that manifest. So vulnerability is the, for me, I, I guess it's how comfortable are you expressing your true nature? And if, if you're scared of that, then you are extremely vulnerable, you know, whereas I think if you, if you're happy to express yourself freely without fear of judgment, then you should, then vulnerability uh, doesn't take, does it should, I don't think you will be vulnerable. And I said this the other day, it's interesting because, I was asked to do a talk coming up in a couple of months in Sydney for, uh, there's a talk coming from overseas, a, a fellow called David Avocado Wolf, uh, mm -hmm. who's well known in the, in the health space. And I work with a company called Inner, Inner Origin. I'm one of the ambassadors and they just brought David on as an ambassador for the United States. And I'm one of the ambassadors for Australia. And they said, David's coming out. Would you like to come on stage and have a chat? And, and I said, yeah, it's, that sounds interesting. I've never met David. I've heard about him. I know he loves um, uh, medicinal mushrooms and he's a big advocate for cacao and I'd love to pick his brain on some of these things. It was interesting because I shared my, uh, that we're going to be on stage together or one at a time. And the amount of negativity that I got, it was, it was 
bizarre. Like it was so bizarre. And one of the main things that people said was, by you agreeing to do this, you have lost all credibility in, in, in my eyes. And that was a common thread for people. And I responded, I said, I said, um, do you think I care about my credibility? I said, why do you care about my cred credibility? Because, and, and define what credibility means and why should I worry about it? Mm. It's a perception for you that I will lose credibility. And they said, well, he is this, that, and the other. And they used all these different names to describe what David talks about. And I said, well, I said, so why can I, can I get up on stage and express my authentic self and my authentic views to a room full of people that may be there for something else? I said, hey, can you not perceive that that, that could be a, a positive thing as, as to why I chose to do it? You know? I said, haven't we, aren't we allowed to have free speech and, and present different views? And, and, you know, my view will possibly be very different from David's view. And that's completely fine. You know, it's, I'm going to express my authentic self in that situation. And I don't view my credibility as something that I have a fear about. Because if I cared about my credibility, <laughs> I, don't, I'd, uh, I think I'd be insane by now. <laughs> to define it you know with with so many different viewpoints and 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 beliefs out there if you judged yourself against everybody else whoa yeah well it, it's interesting because we can be so harsh on ourselves first of all and judge ourselves and then we can then judge others mm -hmm. And probably judge others just like we judge ourselves anyway, internally, without even realizing that we're doing it all the time. But then we never, we never put ourselves out there and speak up or, or actually be our true selves and truths. And then yeah. we, we, we build this cage almost around it that we think we feel safe from it all. And, and it was interesting because I spoke to the, when the people s suggested I, I come up on stage and, and I said, you I said, I, I'm, I believe and I'm aware that I think David's a vegetarian, maybe slash vegan uh, talker. I said, and you know that I enjoy eating meat and that's part of the message that I put out there. I said, does David have a problem with it? And they came back and they said, no, David doesn't have a problem with it. I'm like, fantastic. Yeah. But it seems other people have a problem with it. And, and how much of that is their identity? You know, and I, and I thought about it. I was like, why is this cause so much? And why are people worried about my credibility? What am I to them for them to worry about yeah. my credibility? Is it, and it, it was a question that I asked myself. And I was like, well, what is it in this person's life or these people's lives that this has created a, uh, an issue for them that has, has become a catalyst for them to, 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 to deal with their own identity, you know, and, and it's brilliant because, and I don't know the answer because, I, you know, each and every one of us is individual and uh, my experience as to why I might be like this is not the same as somebody else's, but it, it got me really thinking about these, our identity and, and, and what it is in our day-to-day -day life when things come through our through our journey, when things get under our skin, and we're like, oh, geez, I, I, you know, you could be following someone on Instagram and you, you see a picture and go, oh, that's, that's affected me. Why has that affected me? It's actually just somebody doing something. But why have I got an issue with this? You know, and it could be positive, it could be negative. Yeah. What, what is it within me that this is a mirror for, that I've got something to learn from here? And I wondered what that is for these people with, with me being on stage with this event. And I'm just using this as, a, as, as an example. But, uh, but I wonder how many people actually said, this is a mirror for an issue that I have. Why is this affecting me so much? Because it really affected people. And it doesn't affect me, you know. I, and someone said, would you get up on stage with Trump, you know, at one of his rallies? I said, why is that I get up on stage at Hillary's? I get off stage with our dear prime minister. If somebody asked me to present my authentic self, 
yeah. at, at somewhere, why not? You know, what does it matter that somebody else is doing something else or presenting their own unique self afterwards or before or at the same time or in a debate or anything? I said, yeah. why, should, why should we fear what other people will think of us by us presenting our authentic self? And I, I, and I said this to somebody um, the other day because somebody said, you, go, you, don't care about the th- you don't care about other people. I said, and no, I said, you're, you're, you are wrong there. I said, I care about other people. I just don't care about what they think of me. I said, there's a huge difference. And if people, I don't want, I never want to tell people what to do, but think about that for, for a minute. We, we all care for other people. We inherently, that's, that's our nature as human beings. We do care. We will, we will help somebody if they're, if they're in a situation that they can be saved. We will drop everything to help somebody. It's in our nature. It's, it's sort of like it overrides everything. We will help people or animals or whatever it may be. But I do believe that there is a, a portion of the population that cares too much about what other people think of them. And again, why, why is that an issue for people? And no doubt there'll be a, a point in somebody's time, history or life or multiple uh, examples of this which have created this belief where they worry about what other people think. Totally. And I'm in that unique position where I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and because I've got nothing to lose. Yeah. I, do, I have nothing to lose because what is it that anybody could take away from me except myself? Yeah. You know, and, and that can't happen. It, can, it can't happen because there's nothing that, that no one can take away my identity of who I am. 100%. And the moment you, and the moment you, you get to that, point where you stop giving a shit with everything and everyone and, and just live that. And this, and this comes from heart, right? Because you're like, I'm just expressing myself to the full potential and it's up to everyone else how they see that. But you know, when it's coming from that space, then it's, it's the right thing for us to be doing at that single point in time. Mm. Have you, have you always been like that or did culture, culture have have its shaping way with you has there been any like catalyst points along the way uh, there has i'm just going to grab my computer charger for one second go for it man that i'm going to allow battery so give me two seconds maybe five i'll be back no, you're all right, mate. that's all right i'm back <laughs> i've done similar mistakes after nearly 200 podcasts mate I can <laughs> and um so the catalyst for this is um I was saying to someone the other day that I've had probably a thousand different sessions. Uh, some people will call them therapy. Uh, I call them uh, self-analysis, uh, self-awareness journeys. So uh, over the last 25 years, so it's something I've been fascinated with. Uh, at the age of 19, I did uh, Anthony De Robbins' three-day uh, Unleash the Power Within or yeah. Awaken the Giant Within course, which was profound because I had no idea that the human potential uh, could, or the potential for, for human beings could be so profound about how to set goals, how to deal with fear, how to open up, how to be our authentic self. And, and I got a lot out of that. And that was sort of the, uh, the catalyst for um, personal development and understanding. It's not even development, it's just understanding and awareness. And uh, from that, I became a, uh, a, a, an avid reader on all topics to do with this. And then I sought out different, different professionals that um, it's like people go to a restaurant to get cooked good food from a chef. There are people out there that help that are professionals in helping you access and understand who you are or your authentic self and identity. And uh, sorry, I got my little (laughs) She knows exactly who she (laughs) <laughs> she is don't she and uh i mean that that's the thing animals are just amazing creatures because they're just they are their authentic self they don't give a fuck yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, uh, i'm gonna give you a lick now because i want to give you a lick <laughs> and, uh, you know she's just showering me with love at this right at this particular point in time thank you for that um so i've 
yeah, I worked it out. It's probably a, a bit, give or take, but roughly a thousand sessions. And each mm-hmm. one is, is to understand more about myself and why I have chosen this, this way of life in, in, and what it is that helps me make these decisions. Uh, have the decisions in my life been out of love or out of fear? Have they been to please other people? Have they been to please myself? Is it a combination of both? Have I chosen uh, this, that, and the other based on what I want or what culture says, you know, in it? And more and more, I believe that I am making the choices that benefit myself, you know, and that, that might sound selfish, but really, once we are operating out of a place that is beneficial for us. then we have the capacity to not only lead by example, but also present a different way of living uh, that may inspire, that may encourage, that may make people question or question people doubt um, about their own way of thinking as well. And, And I love having these conversations with people. I really do because uh, I learn a lot from them. And one thing that I do love to do is, is to listen to how people, how do people talk? Yeah. And what is the, what is the language that they use for themselves and for others? The words we speak are very powerful. <laughs> they they are aware of it. You know, it's, ex- they're extremely powerful and they tell, tell us a lot about ourselves. And, I did a great podcast recently with uh, a fellow called Martin Ball on my own podcast. And he talks about identity and characters that we play. And it's just brilliant. And he wrote a book called Being Human, which I think is, is one of the most profound books I've ever read. And it talks about this in, in great detail about the characters that we play. because it, And what does it mean to tap into that that unconditional love, trust and acceptance that we have and that we all, we all can share with others. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, Pete as well, I've been loving your podcast recently. Oh, thank you, Billy. Yeah. 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 I listened to um, Dr. Alberto Bellado. Yeah. He's brilliant. Hey, wow. Exceptional. That that, that actually pricked my interest because I did, I worked with a shaman about five years ago and I was intrigued to see what he what, uh, what he would share. It was, yeah, it was quite incredible. I certainly encourage everyone listeners to check that out. Yeah, well, that's that's the next documentary that I'm making. So uh, we're in pre-production for this at the moment. So it's about I, I saw the magic pill as a way to address uh, how powerful food can be as one of our tools for um, self-love and self-nourishment. Uh, and I, the next film, and I'm going to do a series of these, uh, if, the, if everything goes to plan, but the next film is about, uh, talking about expanding consciousness and what it means to be human and how do we think, how do we interact? How do we connect? Uh, what are the tools that we have available to us as human beings to get to the source of our authentic self? How do we Show, how do we understand our vulnerability? And w- one of the tools, I'm obviously, as I said, I've done many, many sessions with different practitioners. And even the intent to go to these practitioners is one of vulnerability. And it's interesting because I've sent different family members and, or not sent, but I've encouraged different family members and friends and say, hey, I know you're having trouble with this at the moment. Perhaps you might like to see so-and-so yeah. they've done, they've done, I've, I've, I've gained great insights into, into my own self through the exploration of the tools that these people use. And it's, it's fascinating because people will either shut it down straight away yeah. and go, or oh, you're weak. If you, if you, if you have to go and see someone for that, it means you're that you're weak. And, uh, you know, I got brought up in a family where we sort our own shit out (laughs) and, uh, or alternatively people will go and see these different practitioners and they come out and go, 
Yeah, that wasn't for me. That was that was too confronting, very confronting. And and you know, uh, and the person that I saw, they weren't that that nice to me. You know, they they actually told me off. <laughs> it, I'm like, hmm, maybe. Yeah, that that's probably how that per, that that person deals with your identity, because they they want to cut through, yeah. and show you your true self. And for that, it can be very challenging for people because they have to be open. They have to be vulnerable. They have to bring up uh, experiences possibly from their past that they've shut down or have just accepted and to actually go and analyze that and to reopen that wound can be very challenging. So for instance, this, this documentary where part of it, not the whole thing, but part of it, we're going to explore um, plant medicines, for instance, with sh shamans, because to actually go that next step and actually um, uh, decide to use plant medicines, you know that you have to, you're going to f show your vulnerability. It will present itself to you, whether you like it or not. <laughs> You know, it will, there will be moments during those journeys uh, that will be terrifying because your true self will present itself for you to, 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 for you to be aware and for you to learn from. And, and again, that's not for everybody, you know, and, and obviously there's, there's warnings and cautions just like anything. It's, it's, uh, Everything in life needs to be, um, have to have common sense, but in the right set and setting with the right practitioner, yeah. uh, great truths can be presented to yourself. Well, you can present yourself with great truth about who you are. You know, uh, it's, not, it's not in the shaman's hands. It's not in the medicine's hands or the plant medicine's hands because we have all the answers uh, ultimately in us anyway. We know all the answers. These are just tools, just like a different therapist may be able to access different parts of us, our consciousness, you know, that is also another tool. So we will be exploring these different tools and modalities that are out there for us to know more about self. So that's the, that's the next project that wow. I'm working on. And that's and it's, incredible. Yeah. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. And it'll be, it, it, with the last program that with the last magic pill, it was about planting the seed. It wasn't say, just do this. It was like, here's the potential and here's some case studies or, or different anecdotal stories of people that um, from different walks of life that seem to be improving through a simple change in dietary nutrition. Yeah. So that's how we're going to explore this. These are some different people that are going through their journey of self-discovery and it's, uh, take with it from you like, but we're just going to plant the seeds that there is more to life than mainstream media and the way our this waking existence. Hundred percent. You know, it, it's. I always think of this gentleman. I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a um, a guy called Joshua Mantz. I haven't heard of him. Right. He wrote, he wrote a book called The Beauty of a Darker Soul, and uh, he was a military pl platoon leader. Wow. And he got shot by a sniper in 2006 and he died for 15 minutes and they were CPR on him for 15 minutes. It was quite incredible. And, uh, and when he came out of that, he went into a complete depression for about 10 years. And then he finally started to well, with PTSD, but he, he actually started to look, I guess, himself from within and he said the moment he decided to do that and look at other means to to get past this trauma he his words were it took more courage for me to look at myself than actually running into any firefight that i did during the military and what he said was what as well was what was really fascinating was that the incident that he thought was the trauma hmm. only magnified what was already within him correct prior to that Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. And it's just and he's he's out he's just an amazing human being and he's he's out there now really advocating this message. But uh, I I often think about that and certainly can relate to people and appreciate where they're at to to know that, to look at yourself and and know thy truth of yourself. It 
it definitely takes courage, but it's so rewarding when you do. Well, if you can look at everybody as a, as another version of yourself, that's the key because we all are just, uh, best way to explain this. Um, from my perspective or my perception is we are all just beings of energy. We're all yep. just uh, expressions of energy uh, from, and I'm not religious. So <laughs> in, in, in any state, in any uh, description that I'm about to give, but we're all part of the universal consciousness and we, that universal consciousness is expressing itself now and we are all part of that there's no separation we just believe the separation so i'm looking at you you're just a different version of that universal consciousness or some people would use the word god you know and everybody is that playing that role out simultaneously but we're all the same we're just having a different experience with our different identities that makes us feel that we are separate even though we're all connected. Yeah. So it's, um, and as that guy you were just talking about, looking inside, you will discover that we are just these, these beings of unconditional love, just and acceptance. It's just that our filters of the world uh, that we've set up to protect us <laughs> uh, mask our, our true nature. And looking inside, you will discover that there's some, some, some truths and realizations that are frightening for us. But also, once we start to dig a little bit deeper, it can be the most uh, powerful, life-changing, encouraging aspects to us. And, and we all have that element of darkness and shadow and, and light. I mean... And, and through my own work with um, uh, plant medicines and entheogens, uh, you, you discover that. And it's very hard to, to put it into language, but when you have an experience of, of everything, a non-dual experience, and, and what you, can, you can access that through, um, uh, through different states of consciousness, whether it be through breathing practices or meditation or fasting rituals or through these entheogens, um, especially the Bufo alvarius toad, which has a 5-MeO-DMT. Once you have that experience, um, it's, you have the experience of everything, which is the experience is not just light and love. It's death and decay and destruction and everything all happening at once in no particular point in time either so it's it's everything and, and i'm looking at your t-shirt <laughs> and it says trust me i know what i'm doing the universe you know and, and that could be uh universal consciousness is is exactly right it's 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 everything yeah you yeah. so Nirvana for me, or that state of samadhi, is, and once you've experienced it, it isn't just pure love and light. It's everything. We have the, and, and human beings have the capacity to experience all. We have the the capacity to hurt. We have the capacity to kill. We have the capacity to love. We have the capacity to heal. We have the capacity to do everything it's that's why there are people in the past that have become tyrants. And that's why there's people that are just pure love. We have the capacity to, to be anything that we choose to be based on our experiences and our identities. And now we, we could do it all. And I'm not encouraging everyone to do that, but I think we have to have the understanding that there's, and again, I don't want to say the wrong words here. Um, cause I can't eloquently put it into, into a concise statement, but, um, is it, when we explore our darkness, we have to understand that there's, that's, there's nothing wrong with us for having those thoughts or desires. It's just 
part of our human nature. But the question is, why do we, why are we going to act on them or are we going to suppress them or how are we going to learn to understand them and respect them that they're there, you know, and, and that can take a lot of work. It can take a lot of work. Um, and it can be frightening for people and very, very challenging. So again, it, it's about that vulnerability because we live in a society now that, you know, it's very unique. <laughs> would I say it's natural or normal? No, I would not. <clears throat> can we make it natural and normal through, through our choices? To the best of our ability, I think we can. Uh, but it's, I was, I was talking to a fellow called Christopher Ryan who wrote a book called Sex at Dawn. And it was fascinating. He looks at our evolutionary history as sexual beings and what it means to be in a family structure or uh, in a modern day world. And he talks about why there's so much addiction to porn out there, why there's so much, the high rate of divorce, high rate of infidelity, cheating, why marriages and relationships fail so much. And obviously there's <clears throat> relationships are, are a different conversation here because here you've got two different belief systems or energetic patterns coming up against each other and, and things evolve and grow. But, but looking at it from an evolutionary history, like we did with food, with the magic pill, if we look at it just through relationships and sex and, and parenting for, for most of our existence, it's very different from how we do it these days because there was never such a thing as possession. In, yeah. in those uh, primitive, and I don't like to use the word primitive, but uh, uh, societies, you know, we would hunt, we would gather, we would share, you know, and the raising of the children would be in a shared environment, you know, and the possession of man and wife or whatever the, the construct was. He said, there's very, there's hardly, there's no evidence that that ever existed until we started with agriculture. And then we set up uh, permanent structures, which then, created the religious systems, but also the political systems, which created possession of land. And so all of these things are quite modern day constructs of human, human beings, you know, and is it natural? And I watched this great documentary the other night with, with uh, David Attenborough on the empire of the ants. Okay. <clears throat> and I, I thoroughly recommend it because the, the wonderful thing about it is there's in this one area of, of Europe, two different colonies of ants. One, they fight each other, same ants as this other colony that's called a super colony. And this super colony has billions and billions and billions of ants in it, but they all get along. There's no fighting. There's no, the, they believe it's the, these ants have evolved to get along in a, in a way that, again, there's no possession, but they're all working for a common goal. Whereas these other ants, they're only a few kilometers away from them, have st are still in the evolutionary process where they're, they're fighting for possession of, of space and, and territory. And I thoroughly recommend it because one of the things that people are talking about now is that human beings are actually a colony as well. And that we believe, or they believe that in the future, we will have to start. It's inevitable that we will start working together for the future of our colony. We will have a super colony and for the future of the planet and the environment that we work on, because at the moment we're, we're worried about possession and what's mine and what's yours and whether it's political or, or national and the, the wars over our resources. So if you look at that documentary where that, those anthills at the moment in our cultural society, but the, the future is this, 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 uh, this super quality of ants that are all working for a common good. And I see that as where the universe will take humanity or where humans will work with, um, work together. And is that going to be part? How is that going to take place? Is it going to be artificial intelligence in corporation so that we all have a common connection? Possibly some th uh, futurists believe that is the way if you look at Dan Brown's book, Origin, which is a pretty amazing novel, but the, the underlying message there is 
where have we come from? Where are we going as energetic beings? We're fusing with technology at the moment. I mean, uh, if you listen to Elon Musk's uh, podcast last night with uh, Joe Rogan, for instance, he's saying, you know, we've already fused with technology as we're connected oh, to that true. and we're connected to this. It's part of us now, you know, for, for a large percentage of, of the Western population. And, you know, is the, is the joining of the artificial intelligence with humans the future? And then you speak with other people that talk about the, the uh, experience that you have on these plant medicines, which open up our neural pathways to uh, overwhelm ourself of, or our identity of self. So we have this non-dual experience where we have the experience of everything as one and connecting, how can we, is that going to be the future where that is downloaded into artificial intelligence and connected to us as human beings? So we all can feel that, that state of, of, of being that is called Samadhi or Nirvana. And will we operate at that default level in the future? I don't know. I don't know, but there's so many possibilities out there for, a, a connected future for us because something has to change and it is changing yeah, for, us to, for us to um, save the environment, save the planet, save humanity and work as, work as one. Yeah. And it's, how quickly is that going to happen? I'm not sure, but we're going to delve into that into the next movie. You know, that yeah. We, and plant those seeds and see where they when, go. When are you hoping for the movie to come out, Pete? Oh, probably a year and a half, I'd say. Maybe oh, two oh, years. Wow, yeah. These things take time. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, mate. No doubt. <laughs> There's no rush. Yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting everything you've just said, all the way from connection to consciousness to the ants. And it, like, cause I, I literally released a podcast two days ago with um, a NASA physicist named Tom Campbell. And he studied consciousness for over 40 years as a side project. And, and it was quite incredible what he is, he is saying. And, it, and it, he's just using the language of science with everything that you, you were speaking of then. And, and he calls it, you know, the, the role of consciousness is of um, a lowering of entropy. So from disorder to orderliness. And that, is, and, that, and that comes from within us being like small fractal points into our communities, into societies into global mm -hmm. and we get so caught up in our lives with the daily stresses and we don't you know it's it's even hard to contemplate this stuff half the time but when you remove those external stresses a little bit and have some time for yourself it's it's quite incredible what uh, what can open up well, well it's interesting and you talk about that and i said it the other night i said it isn't isn't it a strange world that we live in where we have to go to work, you know, in these, these jobs that for most people or for a lot of people, it, they're unfulfilling, you know, they're, they're monotonous, they're repeti repetitious, they're, <clears throat> they're created in a way that uh, doesn't benefit our, for our bodies to move, to, to interact with nature. Um, but then on the flip side of that, you, you just said, imagine if we had more time and uh, time is a, a really interesting one because uh, for some people, I, and I've spoken to quite a few people, they're actually fearful of having too much time on their hands. What am I going to do with that? Because, and I need to be around different people or I need to keep, keep busy because time means possibly looking at myself you know because that's yeah. what happens when you have time yeah. by yourself you're you're left with yourself <laughs> you know, which can be frightening for some people <clears throat> totally. and i'm not judging them because obviously that has been a something that's happened uh throughout their experience and it's interesting because i watch some parents and i was very uh my intention when I had children was to make sure that they were not, uh, that they got to experience life with not just their parents as their only carers, because I'd seen kids become clingy and, 
and this, that, and the other. And so from their very early age, it was, my children had the experience of their grandparents and their uncles and, and uh, nearly like a, a small tribe helping raise them. So they got all these different experiences, all these different belief systems and not just mine and their mums, you know, and, um, and now they're so independent and they're so happy to be either by themselves or with other people that then it's not just mum and dad. And I think that's so imperative. And I think that potentially could go down the path of, um, do you like to spend time by yourself? Are you comfortable in your own skin spending some quiet time with you, with, with you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> because I love it, but I also love the, the connection of others. Of course. Well. Yeah. I know they, they did a, stu- they did a study where they were putting people in a room by themselves and they, there was a machine in the middle that would give them an electric shock. And they said, if you touch it, it's going to hurt you. And within 10 minutes, 90% of them touched it because they couldn't handle the isolation with themselves in the room. Interesting. But there you go. Man, I'm aware of the time of the podcast, so I ask everyone on the show some questions. So I'm going to change gears slightly for you, Pete. Yep, please. And uh, the first question I ask everyone is, what's been a low point in your life, but has later turned out to be a blessing? Hmm, a low point in my life? Um, wow. Probably, um, probably my parents' divorce when I was... I think about two or three, and I don't remember too much about it, but um, what it has done has uh, presented me or or given me the opportunity to delve deeper into relationships and, and, and not to repeat the mistakes of my parents. Um, And for instance, uh, um, best way to say this i'll just come out and say it but um sometimes when i see say some my father for instance um and he's in his 70s now nearing his 80s uh, over the years over the decades i have heard uh the same story about if only your mother and i hadn't have separated we'd have this much money you know because we had to divide our things and blah 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 and i'm like dad yeah you know I, i i've heard this story you know, so what are you saying? It was a fi- you're upset over the financial loss because that's what it sounds like. It never once have you really talked about the loss of the family unit. So, and that's an interesting thing. And I'm not, I'm not judging him because obviously he's got his own, uh, had his own upbringing and, and yeah. obviously that meant something to him. And, and I think success for him was to do with status and what that looked like from a business point of view. And that's completely, completely cool. But for me as a child hearing that story, it's like, Hmm, interesting that that money or uh, something like that success is seems important to you over other things. So that really gave me a, um, uh, a realization or an understanding into belief systems and what I don't want to be right? or how to express myself in different ways. And, and obviously um, I have two children, beautiful children, and I'm separated from their mother. And, and I don't think the kids will ever hear me say, geez, I wish if we had a stay together, we'd have, you know, yeah. and I'm very aware of my communication with my children about those about situations like that, you know? So that low point back then of the family disintegration, because it, because it separated my brother, my sister, my mum, my father and myself. And it, it sent us all in different directions in our lives. It really did it. it um, it was the separation of that family unit that has encouraged me to find out more about why we, not only why we choose the things that we choose in life based on our belief systems and, but also how to, how to navigate this world better, especially now being a father so that uh, my children (laughs) or our children, um, uh, have the best possible chance of being their authentic self yeah. without 
my um, <laughs> my intervention or, or into that. So I'm constantly encouraging and and myself to get out of the way and not put my beliefs or my fears or uh, into their space. And and it's very difficult. I tell you, it's a challenging thing. It really is a challenging thing as a parent. And but uh, I love the. Uh, I actually love this, this nature of it because I, I learn so much about myself every time I open my mouth with my children. Yeah, I can imagine. It was fascinating because I, I had a discussion with somebody yesterday because um, both my kids ski and they ski very well. They do a, a, Their modality is mogul skiing, which is freaking challenging. Like if you get to pick any sport to do, that's probably the most unnatural sport to do for a, for a human being would be mogul skiing, right? It's, it's, it's challenging on the knees. It's challenging on the bodies. And my daughter just came fifth in the national titles this week. And my other daughter competes tomorrow because their mum was a mogul skier. She was a professional mogul skier. And both of my daughters both love dancing as well. And they're both great little surfers, but dancing seems to be their number one passion. It's there. It's, their expression, their expressive release. And I was speaking to someone yesterday, I said, the kids have done mogul skiing since they were very young. Obviously, most mogul skiers end up with knee reconstructions and problems with their knees. Uh, my ex-partner didn't. She was one of the few people that it didn't damage their knees. And I was like, how do I, should I let the children know that there's the potential possibility of knee problems in the future by continuing this sport that they love as a parent isn't my role to make them aware of this but i'm also consciously aware that you don't want to plant the seeds of that could happen and for them not to enjoy the sport but then there's also the flip side of that is it's my ex part of the mother of the girls who we have a great relationship with um is it undermining her, her thing that she's taught the kids? And I don't want to bring any fear into that either. But I also know that they love their, their dancing and that's their number one sport. And if something happens to their knees, because my daughter had a fall the other day and I got this phone call, I think she's broken her leg. And I'm like, wow, you know, what does that mean for her dancing for the future? And um, so I spoke with this, this friend of mine yesterday and he said, he said, it's a really tricky one. And I said, yeah, fuck, it's tricky. It's tricky because I, I actually don't know what the right course of action here as a parent is. And he said, you have to trust in the universe that the kids know exactly what's going on. You know, that whatever happens, they, it, it's, it's happening as it, as it should be. And if you feel compelled to, to mention it, then, then so be it because that's in your authentic self to be concerned for your children you know and it's an interesting one and um so i actually had a chat with my youngest daughter when i picked her up from the from the thing and we talked about uh skiing and and i said you know whenever we talk about because they surf i said the wonderful thing about surfing is it's it's such a, a beautiful sport but there's inherent dangers in there i said there's drowning there's getting hit by your board there's getting hit by other boards there's hitting the reef cutting yourself uh there's sharks obviously there's 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 everything i said it's a as far as sports go it's a pretty challenging sport and there's a lot of a lot of obstacles out there i said and i've made you aware of those in the past but you still continue to do it i said i just want to make you aware that with skiing or especially moguls there is the potential that some people get problems with their knees so i actually verbalized that and i said i said it's the one and only time I will ever say it, but I just felt as a parent, like I did with surfing and like I've done with horse riding and other aspects and wakeboarding that there's the potential risk. Cause I never told them of the potential risk. Yeah. And I, so I put it out there <laughs> and I felt okay about it, but it was interesting because going back to being the parent, you don't want to create unnecessary belief patterns that aren't going to serve them. So, but I'm learning a lot about this each and every single day. And I, I can only imagine. 
I don't know. I don't. I guess what I'm saying is I don't have all the answers, yeah. and I, I don't even have many answers. But I'm I'm constantly searching for the 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 choices that resonate the most with me that I feel comfortable with yeah. that I can express my authentic self. And, yeah. and in that instance, it was expressing my unconditional love for my children that, uh, that, and possibly actually there was probably fear in that as well, because I thought, fuck, what happens if they get problems in it? And they go, fuck dad, you didn't tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so possibly there's a fear in there for me as well. Hmm. Interesting. See, I'm, I'm thinking about it now. Totally, totally. Well, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> that was a long story. Yeah, that's, no, oh, it's no, all, no. It all makes sense. It all absolutely makes sense. And I don't have children yet, so we're working on it. But yeah, I've got all that to come. Cool. You know, I'll, I'll certainly learn a lot more about myself, that's for sure. Um, what does your morning routine look like usually? Every day is different. Okay. Every day is different. Um, and it's a, it's a question I get asked a lot. And, oh, yeah. And I usually just say, well, I breathe <laughs> and, uh, and open up my eyes. But because every day is different because I, I live in a couple of different locations, but I'm on the road maybe nine or 10 months of the year. Oh, wow. Uh, coming back and forth in between that, you know, I'll be back for two days then I'll go for a day, then I'm back for a day, then I'm away. So <clears throat> every single day is different. And every, at the moment, I work till 3 or 4 a.m. every third or fourth night. So that throws my routine out. So yeah. Because then I'll have, because I'll still wake up at six thirty. Because that's how my my body clock is, even without an alarm. And so sometimes I get two or three hours sleep, and then I'm just like, whoa, how am I going to deal with today? What's the best thing that's going to serve me? Because obviously I don't want to overdo my uh, my my energy stores, so to speak. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to go do a, a, a wild workout or go surfing for three hours if I've had two hours sleep. I'll, I'll go into that. You know. Um, that state of just relaxation, not doing too much, maybe go and have some different therapies to reignite, whether it be red light therapy, ozone therapy, uh, some PEMF uh, therapy, uh, whatever it may be, just to infrared sauna, cryotherapy, anything to get the mitochondria function mm -hmm upregulated, I guess is the right term, or it could be as simple as just going having a massage and just really, yeah. really zoning out. So every day for me is different, but I guess if uh, ideally I would go for a surf, <laughs> if there's surf, otherwise I'll immerse myself in the ocean or a pool or something. Uh, Cause I love water. I, water for me is, is very, very healing. I just, I really relate with being underwater or immersed in water. That yeah. to me is, is paramount. And I have a bath every single day that I can. Uh, I put magnesium in it. So I, I like cold water therapy, but then I like a, a nice warm, hot bath with magnesium salts in it over night time. So if I can get those two ends of the spectrum happening uh, in one day, it's a good day. And if it's surfing, then that's great. Um, obviously, connection with my wife and children is is paramount if I can get that. Uh, if I can't get it in the flesh, then I'll get it through um, through like this, yeah. technology, technology. <laughs> yeah, uh, which is great. Um, and then obviously it's, it's nourishing the body with food if yeah. I choose to eat that day. Generally these days I eat one meal, maybe two meals a day. Um, if I'm going away and I'm on a, on a surfing holiday, I'll eat three meals a day and I'll eat big meals because I'm surfing six or seven hours a day. Yeah. But I don't usually do that in my day-to-day -day life. So usually one to two meals is plenty for me. Um, and some sort of expression of self. And yeah. that, could, that could be work. I see work as an expression of myself in the, the jobs that I choose to do. Um, or it can be podcasts for this, which I see as a, another form of work or expression. Um, so... The keys for me is good sleep when I can. Proper hydration with uh, clean water yeah. is every day. Good nutrition is every single day. Uh, understanding of self is, is constant. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Never ending. Whether it be in sleep or dreams or in waking life, that's, that's a constant. And, and 
I'm, I'm not fanatical about it, but, but I do think about the choices that I make throughout the day and I reflect on the choices that I made earlier that day. Um, and then there's some sort of movement involved and I'm not uh, at this particular point in my life. I, I just nourish myself with that. I just go for a walk or play with a dog or go for a swim or go for a surf or jump on the trampoline. Uh, I do some push ups here and there, but uh, I'm, I do a little bit of that. And then obviously it's about different types of therapies as we discussed for, um, for biohacking. And at home we have, um, uh, I have a juve light, which is there. I'm sitting on a PE amp mat right here. Okay. Um, I have an ozone therapy machine there. Uh, we sleep on earthing sheets. Uh, I've got an infrared sauna here as well downstairs in the house i have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber so between those modalities i will do a combination of them when i'm either here at home uh, and it could be all of them in one day depending or it could just be one or two depending on the time um, but for instance the pemph pm mat is on right now <laughs> and uh, for our podcast so i am using that at a frequency that is called balance at the moment. It's beautiful. So, I, I, I love that you explore all these things, Pete. It just, it's just fantastic. It, you know, the, the curiosity around those, those aspects as well, and they have such impact on your day. It's, it's amazing. I yeah, it. and if it, um, if it can add years to my life and life to my years, then wow, you know, yeah. it's, and it doesn't, and the great thing is I can meditate while I do this or I can do work while I'm doing it. So it's not like I, I can either, I'm still, I can either still express myself during these periods of self um, improvement, so to speak, uh, or self nourishment, self nourishment or self love. Um, or I can, so I don't see it as, as something I'm doing where I, I don't still present myself authentically. So yeah. either I'll go into a meditation or I'll listen to a podcast and learn at the same time, or I'll be doing my own work. So, uh, and I think that's the key finding how to do these things, whatever it may be. So it, it benefits your lifestyle, whatever yeah. that may be. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I, I think I've covered it there. So yeah, that's, that's the routine of a day. Yeah. Amazing. I love it. Um, last question. If you could have dinner with anyone tonight, <laughs> anywhere in the world from any time frame, who would you reckon it would be and why? Just, just my family. Just your family? Yeah, my kids and my wife. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what makes me the happiest. And I, it's, it's interesting because I am on the road so much that that's, that's what I look forward to the most. Yeah. It really is that that excites me more than anything, you know, and, but I also love my work. So and I, I also love the time that I spend with my family and it, it, it's that balance. And it's interesting because recently my daughter, who's 13, she wants to, once upon a time, and if and when you do have children, it's, it's fascinating because there's, there's these, there's times and moments in your children's life that it's just so profound. So my daughter now is 13. She's in year eight. She's in high school. And once upon a time, every weekend would be like, oh, sh what should we do this weekend? Should we go surfing? Should we go wakeboarding? Should we go to the movies? Should we go out for lunch? Should we, should we go to the, take the dog for a walk? Whatever it is, you know, it was, it was always, we worked it out, but now my daughter's, daughter's like, oh, maybe I'm gonna go spend my weekend with my friend this weekend. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> and it's just like, okay, I have to trust, accept, let go, that she's becoming her, her own self, you know? And time with dad isn't as, I won't say it's not as important, but there's, she, she wants to express herself now as a, an authentic, uh, person and, and create friendships outside of the family unit in a more uh, more profound way for her and that's it's brilliant 
but then there's also me as like, oh no, I'm losing my little girl, you know, because I, I, I love our, our weekends together where we get to play and go do activities together. And I was like, well, maybe I'm not going to get every weekend to do that or every second weekend to do that with them. Maybe it's going to be maybe every month, you know, um, to do those activities. We'll see each other all the time. But, but even that in itself, and that caused an issue for me. And I was like, why, why is this causing an issue? Apart from the, the, the obvious. And it went back to, a, I had a, a session about it with a, a different therapist. And it went back to a time when I was actually um, becoming a, a, a teenager and separating from the family unit. And I won't go into the details, but it, it, there was a different dynamic there than what I'm going through with my own child. Mm. And, um, but it gave me, it, it brought back some, some ideas about being a parent and, and how to take that information and move forward with it so it doesn't affect and, and actually to how cool it is that they're actually uh, creating their own life that they want to live, yeah. you know, instead of me navigating it for them. And it's... I'm excited, but also a little bit sad at the same time. But, but I understand that that's just life, you know, get over it, Pete, and <laughs> celebrate your, your daughter's independence and, and her, her curiosity for life, wherever that may take her. And uh, that's interesting. I've, yeah, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Um, last thing, is there anything else you'd like our listeners to ponder on from everything that we've covered today? Um, choices. I think choices is something very, very overlooked. And our choices really show us who we are. If you want to know who you are, look at the choices that you make each and every day. Yeah. With, and that can, as I said, come down to the food that you eat, the time you go to bed, the movies you watch, the friends you hang out with, the activities you pursue, the job that you or career that you partake in or volunteer in or what you do with your spare time. Look at all of those things under a little bit of a microscope to learn more about who you are because your choices define you and to understand more about yourself is to look at uh, each and every one of those. And, uh, and from that, you'll get to your belief patterns, I believe, as to, hmm, why do I always choose that? Why do I always want to do that? Why do I always want to go to stay up late and watch, binge watch Netflix till midnight, even though I know I'm going to wake up tomorrow feeling like shit. And if I feel like shit the next day, maybe that gives me an excuse not to do that or this or this or that. So choices, I think, is a great place for self-evaluation and self-awareness and, and without judgment, but just acceptance and awareness. And then once you understand why you make that choice or want to know more of why you make that choice and you don't know, then search out the answers. And, you know, you'll, you'll be presented with the right, the right course of action to, to learn more about yourself. Totally, totally. And that, that's a great way to end the show, mate. I appreciate it. And um, so you have the cracking podcast, Recipes for Life. Yeah, it's fun. I all like the, it. All the channels if people want to find out more. And, and the, your website, just PeteEvans.com? PeteEvans.com, yeah. And we've got our Paleo Way program, which is for free. It's a 10-week yeah. program. Uh, no strings. You just go on there. It's a gift to humanity for anyone that wants to use the resources, 300 plus recipes, heaps of interviews. Uh, basically it's meat and vegetables, as you know, <laughs> it's not that extreme. It's uh, it's pretty nourishing. So check it out. Yeah. Well, Peter, I just want to say thank you and for everything that you do and put out there to the world as well. You've certainly inspired me over the years watching from afar as well, Pete. And thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. We'll catch up on the North coast of New South Wales brother too. Thank Definitely. you, everyone, for your time and uh, have, a, have a great one. Thank Love you. Love you. Cheers. Cheers Bye. Bye.